Adam Bant, thank you very much for, for talking to TDA. Um, we're going to get into lots of detail on your policies in a moment, but first can I ask you to give us a 60 second pitch to young voters and I'm going to hold you to time on that. Yeah, sure. At this election, we've got to change the government. Um, the Greens will kick the Liberals out. We'll get into balance of power and we'll push the next government to go further and faster on the climate crisis, which starts with not opening up any more coal and gas mines, but we'll also tackle cost of living by getting dental and mental health into Medicare, wiping student debt and building more affordable homes. And we can do all of those things if we make the billionaires, big corporations pay their fair share of tax. Great. So one of your objectives um, in the election is to end up in the balance of power. Now, you're quite critical of the Labor Party and their policies. If you end up in the balance of power with Labor, are you going to be able to work with them? Yes, and it's what we did in 2010. The first time that I got elected, we ended up in a power sharing parliament. And what happened was Labor, Independents and the Greens all worked together. We got uh, $13 billion for clean and renewable energy. We got dental into Medicare for kids. We got some really good democratic reforms through Parliament. Did everyone get everything they wanted? No. But did we get some good outcomes? Yeah, we did. But like, we've got to get the Liberals out this election, it's our view, because they've made the climate crisis worse. They've pushed up housing, uh, you know, house prices as well. Right. But I mean, you mentioned there that not everyone got what they wanted. Specifically, that was a Labor government that sought to implement a carbon price. And that era of government ended with no carbon price. Um, will it be any different this time? Well, a number of things stood the test of time from that. They're still there, like dental into Medicare for kids, like right. the but Clean But there is no carbon price still, I suppose. No, no, I'm, you're right. Like Tony Abbott and Rupert Murdoch and the fossil fuel industry came and tore it down. That's sure. Right. I mean, I mean, everyone has a part to play that but you know when you get these windows of opportunity how much are you willing to compromise on maybe your first best policy um, to take you know kind of meaningful action that might be a step back from that well i think that's that's exactly what we did in 2010 and like we did we end up with a climate targets that we wanted no we pushed for more action but we compromised and um, when we went into that arrangement we said we wanted to get dental into medicare for everyone we got it in for kids and like we'd like to go back now and finish the job but um, that's that's what we did like it's it's understanding that in a power sharing parliament everyone's got to give a bit right everyone's got to give a bit um, but uh, that's actually i think a good thing and it's probably what people want especially like tackling the big issues they want people and politicians to work together on it. Let's come to that big issue of climate change. So the Greens are calling to get out of fossil fuels by 2030 and net zero by 2035. Uh, TDA spoke to Labor's Chris Bowen, who said, um, you know, he didn't necessarily have a problem with the ambition of that, but that you don't have a plan to get there. What is your plan? We've launched our plan uh, this week, powering past coal and gas. It's on our website, Greens at all today you, and we've had it costed by the Parliamentary Budget Office. And it's a plan that's based out of, uh, based on getting out of coal and gas in a staged way over the next 10 years so that we can support the workers and communities in those areas, but also grow new export industries to come online. Um, it involves building effectively the equivalent of our coal-fired power station fleet, but of renewables across the country over the next 10 years supporting workers in the areas where there's going to be the transition by giving subsidies to new businesses and employers to come in and grow jobs and industries there. And also helping grow new export industries like in things like green steel and green hydrogen. And we fund it by um, stopping giving handouts to the coal and gas corporations and by making them pay their fair share of tax. And when you do that, our plan, our 10 year plan, um, you create over 800,000 jobs and the budget actually ends up better off by about $50 billion, $52 billion. Right. So, I mean, when you, when you talk about the, the transition in that way, you know, it sort of sounds neat phasing out of one and phasing into the other. But of course, I mean, there are hard choices involved in this. We're talking about a really significant sort of transition for Australia and a transformation of the entire Australian economy. In that transition phase, there's obviously going to be pain for particular groups of people, uh, people who have jobs in those industries. Even if, even if you say that transition is eventually going to grow those jobs, there is some pain. Is that uh, something you think the Australian people are ready for? Can I say yes and no? Like it's a, it's a big transition, but we've already got a lot of people who don't work in those industries, right? Australia has a big, a lot of people employed in education, in the care sector, in the health sector, in finance. Like we've, if you actually look at the Australian workforce and the Australian economy at the moment, we've got a lot of people working outside of those sectors. Um, in terms of the transition, like I've been spending a bit of time in those coal regions, going to the Hunter Valley, um, going to Gladstone, going to, going to Townsville, saying, look, here's the change that we need to make. 
here's our plan to do it, let's have a conversation about it. And what I'm finding is people are up for that conversation because the flip side, right, if we don't have a plan, um, well, we know we need to get out of coal and gas, like it just, it's a climate imperative, that's the science. If we don't have a plan, then what happens is these communities, like just, you just wait until a corporation makes a decision that they're not gonna operate their power plant anymore and bang, they make that announcement and then the community's left in the lurch and there's no transition plan to look after. And that's what's happened with the Araran power station here in New South Wales, they bought it forward. It's what happened with Hazelwood in Victoria. So. Um, when you say, look, this change is coming and it's got to come because it's just like coal and gas are the biggest causes of the climate crisis, let's have a plan to do it so that you're not left in the lurch. People are up for that conversation. So, yeah, they are up for it. But, I mean, if you say that people are up for that conversation in, in those sort of parts of the country, why are they voting for, for the major parties and not for the Greens? Well, the, clear, the other clear message, I remember talking to one... Um, Coal worker in uh, in one of the towns in the Hunter Valley who said it's the worst kept secret here that coal has a use by date, but we have those conversations quietly because no government or politician is prepared to come and have an honest conversation with us. They're not leading the debate, and that just creates more anxiety and uncertainty. And I think you look at other countries like Germany where they said right they wanted to get out of coal, for, and they had a ten year plan to do it and it was led by government and the unions and business all working together. Once you surface it and put the idea on the table, people will be part of the, the transition. But there's no leadership is part of the answer to that question. There's no leadership. In fact, you've got the opposite. You've got Liberal, Labor, um, One Nation, all of them going into these towns saying, we can keep going with coal out past 2050 and still meet our climate targets. That is a straight out lie, right? And so when your political leaders are going in saying things that are just basically wrong, it's no wonder that there's anxiety and uncertainty in the community. So we need leadership and that's part of the reason I think you're, st you're still continuing to see those results. Right, um, let's move on to talk about housing. So the Greens uh, have a plan to build 1 million houses. Where are they gonna be? where the community wants them. Um, near places where people uh, want to live and work and they should be good houses. Our plan is based on an assessment that the housing market is cooked. Like it is just completely cooked at the moment. And uh, you know, when this government came to power, the average mortgage was about $340,000, $350,000. The average mortgage is now $600,000. House prices went up 25% in the last 18 months of the pandemic. Like it is getting out of control. Rents, like no one's talking about renters, it's getting out of control. Part of the reason for that is that there are tax handouts that fuel property prices, which none of the others want to touch. We think what we need to do is provide a new pathway in for people who are locked out of the housing market to rent or to buy. So our plan is to build a million homes, but like you referred to, over the next 20 years. <clears throat> Many of those, some of those will be units, some will be freestanding homes. Governments and state governments own a lot of land, including in the inner city, including near places where people want to work. Let's use that land instead of selling it off to developers to build these homes. Right, but I mean, so when you talk about where people want to live and close to the city, uh, I'm renting in your electorate in the seat of Melbourne um, and the council there is, is controlled by the Greens. Uh, a lot of locals in that area tend to resist uh, higher density development in those suburbs and in other suburbs like that close to the city. Are, are those the sorts of areas that you're going to build more houses and how will you convince the locals, some of whom you represent, that that's a good idea? Well, we've had more development than I think than any other federal electorate in Victoria. Like it's been, um, I, I, certainly the last I saw the figures would look like that. Like the concert, the development is happening. But I mean, but areas. the CBDs in that electorate as well, but particularly the suburbs on the outer ring of CBDs in, in both Melbourne and Sydney and, and, and those sorts of suburbs. I think people are for appropriate development, right? That's what I found being the MP for this area for a while. People understand that we need places for people to live and that we can't just keep taking up, you know, suburbs of farmland and sort of further out and keep spreading out forever. People are up for that, but they want it to be appropriate and sustainable development and appropriate development and mostly affordable. Um, but like to come back to this point about where we're going to build it, state and federal governments own a lot of land and at the moment they're selling it off to developers and we're saying, you know, let's get back to the idea of saying there should government should treat housing as a right and that part of government's job is to ensure everyone's got an affordable roof over their head. So if government's got some land, let's build affordable housing on it 
that you can buy into for 300 grand and uh, or you can rent for 25% of your income. Because you look at all those big public housing tower blocks around the place, most of them were built in the 60s, right? Population's grown up, grown, but the um, but this housing stock hasn't. So we're saying government needs to get in and build that. But the tax breaks to people who've already got houses are pushing up prices as well, and that needs attention. Right. Um, moving on to, to First Nations policy into the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Now, the Uluru Statement from the Heart five years ago was made in consultation by, by 250 First Nations leaders, and it had an order, uh, a constitutional voice to Parliament first, followed by a treaty and followed by a truth-telling process. Now, the Greens policy changes the order and starts with the truth-telling process. Why have you diverted from what the First Nations leaders said they wanted? Well, the Statement from the Heart is a really critical statement, and we were the first political party to endorse it and but I'd encourage not, not everyone in I'd encourage everyone to have a read of it because it's like it's a short but powerful statement um, it's really worth having a read of there are a lot of people who signed up to that statement and were part of it who place a lot of weight in fact equal weight on all those elements we want to see all those elements progress right truth treaty and voice and um, our concern is we want to see if we're going to have a referendum on voice for example which means a voice to parliament we want it to succeed, right? We really want it to succeed. If it can succeed in the next parliament, then terrific. Um, what we, uh, we with our First Nations network, with a, with a party with the highest representation of First Nations people in the parliament, like two out of 10 of our members are First Nations women, and we've got a really strong First Nations network, and the message they've said to us very clearly is don't forget about those other elements of it, about telling the truth, and also striking a treaty with our First Nations owners. And we've got to see progress on all of those things. So all we're saying is, and it's worth having a close read of the statement itself, because um, certainly from our First Nations network, they're saying all of those elements are important. And our party's saying, let's see progress on telling the truth about the history of violence and dispossession in this country and on treaty and on voice. And in Victoria, for example, uh, that begun that process towards telling the truth and the, the truth and treaty progress, and it's going well, and it helps um, broaden the case and bring the population along to ensure a vote is successful. The last thing we want to see is an unsuccessful referendum because that could push back change for a while. Um, another big issue in this election is wages growth and the Greens yeah. have a policy to increase minimum wage and also to focus on, I suppose, public sector wages in a number of ways. But what about wages across the economy and particularly in the private sector? What's your plan to get wages growing across the board in Australia? Yeah, well, lifting wages in the public sector actually helps lift wages in the private sector. And that's not just the Greens saying that, it's the Reserve Bank Governor saying that. Um, and the Reserve Bank Governor has actually been really clear that part of the reason that wages in the private sector haven't grown is because the public sector has been held back by the government. But one of the, one of the other things that we've got to do to ensure that wages are lifted, yes, as you said, we want to put a new floor under the minimum wage, so it's 60% of the median wage. That's what they do in the UK. We think we should do it here as well, and that helps lift wages from the bottom up. Um, we'd also like to see when the Fair Work Commission um, lifts the award wages for those workers in those sectors where a lot of women work, so in some of the education sectors, care sectors, so on, lift them higher than inflation so they get a guaranteed wage rise. So they're things that we would do. But we've also got to make it easier for people to organise and fight for their rights at work. And one of the reasons that wages have been, so, have been growing so slowly, or in fact going backwards, is that it's pretty hard to organise and fight for your, for your rights for a wage increase together. So those things, changing it to make it easier to organise, lifting the minimum rate, um, putting those feminised industries, uh, like making sure that we close the gender pay gap by lifting them a bit faster. Uh, and also, I guess the last thing I would say is lifting the level of income support, so job seeker and like to above the poverty line, so that no one's living in poverty, um, all of those things that help lift wages. Right, but I mean, I suppose, you know, to, to a business that feels like they're not in a position, they don't have the money to raise wages, looking at your policy platform as a whole and seeing kind of more taxes for, for a lot of businesses, um, what would you say to, to someone from the business community who said, well, we don't have room to increase wages and this is gonna make it even harder? Well, I guess so in terms of the tax, I'd say, unless you're a billionaire or, you're in charge of a big uh, corporation that's got over $100 million in turnover that's making super profits. We're not talking about 
those people, right? Our policy is about saying billionaires pay more tax and those big corporations that are making super profits but sending their profits offshore, um, they're the ones that we're talking about putting taxes on. So I think that's the first thing to be clear. We're just saying close the loopholes for the, for the upper top end of town. We're not talking about small businesses. Secondly, uh, small businesses want people to come in to their stores and buy things. And to do that, people need disposable income. And that happens through lifting wages, right? And the more, and especially if you're talking about not cutting taxes for the billionaires, but you're talking about lifting wages from the bottom up, people who are, who've got lower incomes don't go off and spend all that money on share portfolios, right? Or their fifth investment property. They spend it in the economy. They come back to businesses and reinvest it. And so the more you lift wages from the bottom up, the more money businesses are going to have because the more money people will have to spend. Right. Um, moving on to, to dental care, which is another one of the big um, policies in your platform um, to give sort of universal access to dental care through Medicare. Why do you think that's not the case already? And why isn't that something that other parties are proposing? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't, like, there's, um, dental should be part of Medicare. Your mouth is part of your body. You should be able to go to your dentist and use your Medicare card to, to do it. Uh, the, um, I don't know the history of why dental wasn't included in the first place, but it's just an anomaly, right? And we should fix it. And especially because at the moment, people are putting off going to the dentist because they can't afford it. And the problem is, the problem just gets worse, right? And you can potentially end up in hospital mm -hmm. from things that could have been prevented. Uh, to the extent that it's a question of money, we think it's eminently affordable to do it. It'd cost less for the government to put dental into Medicare than what people are currently spending at the dentist at the moment. Um, households are spending on average $950 a year on dental care. Our plan to get dental into Medicare works out at about $750 per household equivalent with the government stepping in and doing it. Um, we'd make Clive Palmer pay for it, you know, a billionaire's tax, um, uh, winding back the handouts to people like Clive Palmer so that people could fix their teeth is, is a pretty good deal. Right. Um, I suppose, I mean, the Labor Party's spoken favourably about dental care and Medicare in the past, but but I suppose one of the issues that Labor has to confront as a party of government is that, you know, it, it's a lot of money involved in this. It's sort of tens of billions of dollars in, in this dental policy. There are a lot of sort of social services priorities that are, that are putting pressure on the budget at the moment. And when you're in government, you've kind of got to grapple with those choices. How do you prioritise all of these things? I mean, there's a lot of policies and a lot of spending in this Greens platform. Probably not all of it's going to happen in the next three years. How, how do you pick and choose the priorities here? Yeah, I guess two things. You're right, it's about priorities, right? And so at this election, Liberal and Labor are both saying they're going to give tax cuts to millionaires and billionaires, right? They're going ahead with what's called the stage three tax cuts. R right, but I'm, I mean, I'm asking about but, the, but the Greens is, and your participation in the yeah, but this Yeah, but this is how, but this is my point about priorities and where does the money come from? Because it's a legitimate question, right? The, the tax cuts that they're proposing take $184 billion out of the budget over a decade, right? And the top 1% of income earners get the same as the bottom 60% combined. Right? This, is, this is talking about giving Clive Palmer a $9,000 tax cut a year per year every year. Don't go ahead with an unaffordable, unfair $184 billion expenditure to the top end of town that, where men get twice as much as women do out of it and it overwhelmingly favours the wealthy. Spend that money on things like dental and mental health into Medicare. So I guess what we're saying is the money's there, right? Don't spend it on the people who've got the ear of the politicians at the moment and the powerful and the already wealthy. Spend it on the areas of need. And you can do that without asking everyday people to pay more tax. But, but again, I'm talking about the Greens' participation as a minor party and potentially in the balance yeah, right. of power okay. in this parliament. And suppose that those those you know points you make about tax cuts fall sure. on deaf ears with the major parties. Are you able to point to policies in your platform and say, well, this is priority number one, and if you're not going to sort of make the changes needed for the other ones, yeah, we right. care about this I'll more. get you. Okay. So we we if we've got a comprehensive platform that we would implement if we were in government. If we find ourselves in balance of power, which I think there's every chance that we will, um, certainly in the Senate, we're on track to grow in the Senate and uh, potentially the expense of Pauline Hanson in Queensland, which would be quite nice, but we're on track to hold balance of power in the Senate and potentially in the lower house because everyone is saying it's going to be a tight election. Um, we, we are going to put on the table a list right, of the things that we would focus on. On the climate front, on that list is don't open up new coal and gas mines. We could 
we can have a debate in the next parliament about what our targets should be and what our plans should be, but I think everyone should be able to agree you don't put the fire out by pouring petrol on it. So stop opening up new coal and gas mines. That'll be on the table. Um, dental and mental health into Medicare, wiping student debt, building affordable housing. Like that's, it's not a long list. Like that's some, a few key reforms that we would put on the table. And we think there's ways of funding it just by stopping some handouts to the top. Can I ask about that wiping student debt? Because that's probably the one on that list that we haven't come to today. Um, the, the nature of the HEC system is that you only have to repay your university debt once you start earning an income above a certain level. So doesn't that policy mostly benefit people who are already in reasonably well-paying jobs? What's happened though over time is that the debt has got higher and higher and the threshold that you have to pay it back at has got lower and lower and lower. Right, but if you're wiping hex for everyone, you're still sort of paying the hex debts of some people who are in very high paying jobs. Plus moving to free education. That's right, so addressing, so for the future, if you're coming along, you're not going to incur a, a debt. Um, and then for the people who've already got it. So the thing is that with the hex debt at the moment is that you then, you start your life at a time when people are trying to potentially start a family, trying to find jobs which are increasingly insecure, hard to get, um, the, uh, and, and not necessarily as well paid as people would like, and you do it with a debt. So at that critical period in time, you end up having to pay a chunk of debt off. What we think is a much better way of doing it is to say, you have a progressive tax system. So if you end up using your education to earn a lot more, then you pay a higher rate of tax back through your progressive tax system. And that way you can have it paid for through a progressive taxation system, um, but also ensure that no one is turned away because they're worried about getting into debt. Like my, my sort of, I guess, political beginning was around education. My dad was the first person in his family to go to university. He could go, he went because it was free, but we're seeing debt go up to the point where a lot of people are potentially going to be turned away from going to uni and people are having to pay it back much earlier and the debt is much higher than it used to be. That's the problem. Right, one final question. At the last election, about 37% of people between the ages of 18 and 24 voted Greens, but you didn't get 37% of the total population. Your support among older people is a lot lower. Do the Greens eventually want to become a, a party of government? I suppose to do that, you've got to have a much broader appeal. Or is it better for the Greens not to be a major party, to stay small and not have to compromise? We want to grow and uh, we think our platform is one that people like. And we are growing and, um, you know, Everyone's taking polls with a grain of salt, especially after last election, but we're gaining support in the state parliaments. We're on the rise in the polls. And part of the reason for that is because we're putting forward a plan that I think actually would appeal to a broad section of Australia, right? Right, and but I mean, the, the Greens have been around for 30 years and, and the vote hasn't significantly changed at a national level in, in that time, certainly not to the level where you're in contention to be a government. And that's that's our challenge, right? That, that's You're right, that's our challenge. And our view and what I've learned, I guess, from being in Melbourne, where our vote has sort of doubled more or less over the years, is that the challenge is not our platform, the challenge is people hearing our platform. And I think that's, that's part of my job, right? And it's, and it's one of our, the things that we've got to overcome now is getting our view in front of people, because people know, oh, the Greens will fight for climate. If you want to, someone to fight for you on climate, you vote for the Greens. What they don't know necessarily is um, that we'll also want dental into Medicare, that we're pushing for affordable housing. Like those are things that when we tell people that that's also part of our platform and that just as hard as we'll fight for climate, we're also going to fight for a better life for, for all of us. People like it, and that's been the lesson in Melbourne. And I guess part of my job, my responsibility, I guess, as leader, uh, is to try and replicate that across the country. But I mean, isn't, isn't part of that growth, you know, at some point when you're talking to a broader segment of the Australian population about your platform, you know, for every kind of thing in that platform that they might like, there's going to be a hard choice there as well. And governments have to be realistic with people about costs and benefits of policies. Do you, do you sort of worry about, you know, we see um, scare campaigns on, on difficult policies be very effective all the time. Do, do you really think that you can succeed in winning over a majority of the Australian population? Ultimately, yes, because I mean, like, just look at this election, right? This election just become this narrow contest between a terrible government and a visionless opposition. 
And when we go to people and say, we've got a vision, we've got an alternative, we've had it costed by the parliamentary budget office, we can tell you, you know, how much money comes from closing the tax loopholes for the top end of town and how we yeah, would put that into affordable housing and here's how much our housing policy costs. People like it. People are responding really, really well to what we're putting out there. And in terms of those difficult choices that are made to fund these programs, at the moment, the choices that need to be made are about whether to keep giving tax breaks to people who've got three, four or five houses to go and buy their sixth, seventh or eighth. Like, do we keep giving Clive Palmer a tax cut? Do we keep helping the likes of Clive Palmer buy, put cheap diesel fuel in their trucks, which, you know, those fossil fuel subsidies cost $10 billion a year that you're paying for, like anyone who pays taxes is paying for. We're just saying, let's stop doing that. Let's stop putting money to A, to people who don't need it and B, into industries that are cooking the planet and instead redirect it into things like affordable housing and dental care. Um, that's only a tough choice if you're a billionaire or a multinational corporation that wants to get away with paying no tax. For most people, it is not a tough choice. Um, and when we explain that our platform means you're not paying more, the, these billionaires and big corporations are paying their fair share so that your life can be better, people like it. Adam Ben, thank you very much for talking Thanks to so us. Thanks so much for having us.